So this is reflection number four in T.S. Eliot's Ash Wednesday. I mentioned earlier that Eliot came to Christianity in the late 1920s, and Ash Wednesday is his first developed poem in terms of articulating his faith. In many ways, he's a soul whisperer. You can have horse whispers. Well, much of Ash Wednesday is about being soul whisperer, calling forth from the spirit and the soul what the nature of formation is, uh, being wary of pathways that can perhaps distort the spirit and the soul, and, and also those directions that are worthy to be taken in terms of ordering our desires, ordering our longings. Previous to writing Ash Wednesday, Eliot was very, very much in, uh, immersed in the writings of Dante, Divine Comedy, Vita Nuova, about Beatrice. And 1929, his work on Dante came out. And so the work on Dante very much infuses Ash Wednesday. And this is important to understand. His, his Catholicity was very much informed not only by English literature, but there was a whole movement within writers, artists, poets, within the period of time Eliot was living that also turned to Italy uh, in terms of the great works of classical literature, which Dante was a preeminent figure and Dante's role in terms of formation in the Divine Comedy. So to turn to section four then in Ash Wednesday, which embodies in some ways not only Dante, but we'll move on to the Book of John, the Great Eagle, and then the conclusion in section six. So he asks in four, who walked between the violet and the violet? Now the violet metaphorically, historically, is the flower of the dusk season. So you're not in the brilliance of the day when day star is shining, but you're not in the darkness of the night either. So who is this person who walks? in this twilight zone, not quite full of light, but also not in darkness. Understand suffering and struggle and tragedy. Who is this person who walked between the various ranks of very green? So this is the color of fertility, various um, levels of growth or lack of growth. People uh, attempting to live more fully uh, and yet often not finding and knowing the way to do that. Who does that? She goes in white and blue in Mary's color. So this person who's doing it is blue is the color of eternity. White is the color of integrity. So who, who is this person that does this? She's not speaking. She doesn't seem to be in any way articulating big ideas, but she moves uh, throughout uh, the landscape with people. Uh, she talks of trivial things, so she's willing to, as it were, accommodate where people are. She's willing to talk about trivial things of people, if that's where they are in their journey. It's what we call the principle of accommodation. Uh, you reserve what could be said uh, to people who are not ready to hear what's meant to be said. Uh, she's in ignorance and in knowledge of eternal dollars, so she's partially aware of the sadness, the distress of reality, uh, but in, in many ways uh, she sees and she sees not. So it's this almost mystical figure who moves amongst the forest and moves about the land. Who does that? Um, who moved among the others as they walk? So this is a presence that's moving about people who then made strong the fountains and made fresh the springs. So here's someone who's not engaged in theological debates, exegetical arguments of how the Bible's to be interpreted, how we're to interpret creeds and count, but she brings life. She's one who makes the fountains strong so that people can slake their spiritual uh, thirst and she's fresh the springs. So she brings a presence to reality uh, in terms of who she is. She made cool the dry rock and made firm the sand. So now we're in the desert where in fact there seems to be no growth, where people are struggling for meaning in the midst of suffering and struggle and their personal journey. And she's there, as it were, to the, the, the dry rock. She makes it something you can sit on. Often anyone who's walked in the desert of I have and trekked over dunes, the sand, you can keep losing your footing as you fall within it. But what she makes the firm sand for them. So here's, she in that sense is a moving spiritual director who is with people in the blue of larkspur, blue of Mary's color. So very much you've got the divine presence here. And then um, Eliot says, so vigno no vos, be mindful, be aware of this sort of person. This isn't a person who talks a lot, 
I'm not a person who artic articulates a lot of theological, exegetical, political issues, but be mindful of this type of person, because this is the type of person who quietly, almost unobtrusively, she's amongst us. We don't even know who she is. She's often concealed from us, and yet she's the one who brings the springs of life. So how do we learn, how do we as people be discerning and know who those sorts of women or people are on the journey? And so this is how part, part one of uh, number four comes to an end. So Elliot then goes, but in a sense, be mindful, be aware, be attentive of these sort of people. We may miss them entirely because they seem in many ways uh, not to be the ones on the front stage of life. They're not the ones taking leadership. And yet, ironically, they're the one, very ones who give life. Um, they're so concealed from us. And yet, uh, the more we are attentive, who they are becomes revealed to us in the life they pass on. So here are the years that walk between bearing away the fiddles and the flutes. So these are the times when we're beginning to let go of these things. But who restores, she one who restores, the one who moves in time between sleep and waking. Um, so we often live in this twilight zone. We're not fully awake, but we're not sleeping. So how is the soul awoken more and more? to actually be awake, to be attentive, to be attuned to what the important things are. And she's the one who, who's the one who walks in that zone between sleeping and waking and calls people away from sleep into a deeper level of faith, uh, faithful wakefulness. Her white light is folded, sheathed about her folded, the New Year's walk, and so she re she's restoring, increasingly she's restoring life. It's very interesting, Elliot is not going to use, interestingly enough, in Ash Wednesday or coming into Lent, he's not going to talk a lot about Jesus, he's not going to talk a lot about Christ. Why? Well, the simple reason is, is the language of Jesus and Christ and Christianity have become so devalued, so distorted, so misinterpreted, that for many thoughtful people, they just dismissed it as superstitious, reactionary, irrelevant. So he's going to try and get into the meaning of the story without using words for many that they have found uh, hurt them, has harmed them in the journey, has been painful. Uh, and so they're reacting to it. So how do you tell the story without using the very language, uh, which is, which has, uh, in many ways, uh, created toxins in people's souls. And so he then turns, and so it's this woman who moves about um, the New Year's walk. So she's restoring through a bright cloud of tears. So she herself has entered the, entered the pain of people who've been hurt badly by religion, by Christianity, by the language of Jesus, by the language of Christ, and it's turned them against the very things that can give them life. So through a bright cloud of tears, the years she's restoring, she's trying to, with a new verse. This is what Eliot's getting at. He's going to tell the story with a new verse, the ancient rhyme. So how does one retell that story uh, with a new verse, the old story, but a new verse, the ancient rhyme, redeem the time, redeem, he says. So how do we redeem the Christian story without resorting to the language which, in fact, has done so much to cause pain and sadness in many people's souls and spirits and lives? So redeem, redeem, he says, the time. The unread vision in the higher dream. So what is this unread vision? People don't know how to read it anymore properly. And so he's trying to tell that story, that higher dream, uh, the unread vision and the higher dream. While jeweled unicorns draw by the gilded hearse. So the unicorns are the great symbol of eternity. They're jeweled, they represent that which is great and lovely and attractive and evokes within the spirit something finer and richer. They draw by the gilded hearse. Now the hearse, of course, is something that carries the dead. Um, and this is a gilded hearse in which often religion is prettied up in a gilded way, uh, but in fact the, the, it's carrying just a hearse, a dead understanding of faith that means nothing, and it's the jeweled unicorn that's pulling it away, so in fact the fullness of the ancient rhyme, the old story, can be properly articulated once again. So the silent sister, and this is what she's called, this one who walks amongst and brings the new rhyme, the untold tale. The silent sister, veiled in white and blue. So she's veiled. We can't see her adequately because we ourselves do not know how to see properly. So she's veiled from us because we're veiled 
from ourselves, similar to C.S. Lewis's, till we have faces we cannot see properly until our own face has come forward. And um, so she's veiled in white and blue. We've seen that image before. White, the color of integrity. Blue, the eternal color. Between the yews, behind the garden god. Now the yews are the image historically, uh, the symbol of death and resurrection. The evergreen, they're always green uh, in the midst often of areas where in fact uh, there's not a lot of rain and uh, people are under the blistering sun in the desert, but the you uh, between the yews behind the garden god. So even people who turn to nature as their god, as it were, this truth is even behind that garden god. The world we manicure in sort of ecological uh, approach, that this will satisfy the deeper longings. Uh, this is a story even deeper and older than that itself, uh, whose flute is breathless, uh, bent her head, and signed but spoke no word. So constantly, this is not a woman who speaks literally. Her life is speech uh, in that sense, and she's bringing life to one and all. Signed but spoke no word, but in her lack of speech, the fountain springs up and the birds sang down. So from beneath, she brings life uh, to the depths of people who are in a painful, distress, difficult season. And the song of eternity then comes down and sings to them. And it is her presence that brings eternity and time together. So she redeems the time, redeem the dream. And so it is this woman who once again brings forth the great song that has often been distorted, has been perverted. It's been used and abused by counterfeits and hucksters, but she is here to redeem the time and bring the dream back to reality. The token of the word unheard. So she is a token, an icon in that sense, for the unheard word, unspoken, till the wind shake a thousand whispers from the yew so the yew tree can speak, and after this our exile. And so then Eliot ends uh, section four with this uh, notion to the degree with we understand this, we're going to be caught in exile between not quite fitting into time, but not quite understanding eternity. And how then do we have the interior maturity to actually hear and see someone uh, like the lady who walks between the violet and the violet?